Hey guys, in today's video we're going to be looking at significant figures. We're going to be able to recognize the significant digits in a given value. We're going to be able to do calculations using significant figures, so apply the concept of significant figures in order to give calculated values that have the proper number of digits. And we're going to be using scientific notation and converting between scientific notation and standard notation. So. In a previous video, we talked about the idea of error in measurements and uncertainty in measurements. And we talked about how the last digit of a measured, of a measured value is considered uncertain. Okay, so every measurement is going to have some uncertainty that is going to be inherent in the measurement because of equipment errors or other errors that are going to exist. So if we have a measurement, we are not going to have exact numbers. So no exact numbers in measurements. So because we don't have exact numbers in measurements, we are going to, the digits that we give are going to have meaning. including the last digit, which is uncertain. We don't want to just drop that one off because we're not certain about it. That last digit gives us our best approximation of that value. So if we have 0 0.1 one one milliliters. That 0 0.01 milliliters is saying that we're somewhere between 0 0.10 and 0 0.12. So it gives information about kind of about where we're at, even though we are not entirely certain. So it's still important to write that last digit, and that last digit determines the precision of the measurement. So it gives the precision of the measurement. The smaller the value of that last digit, the more um, precise the measurement itself is. When we're taking measurements, we've got a lot of measurements that we can take, but one of the most common ones that we're going to be doing is reading volumes. And it's important to know how to read a volume. When we're reading volumes, we can read the volume of a graduated cylinder, like we see here. A graduated cylinder is going to have some amount of liquid in it. And when we're trying to read the volume of the liquid within a graduated cylinder, we're going to look at what's called the meniscus. And the meniscus is the bottom of this curving of the water in this case where the water is creeping up the sides of the graduated cylinder. And we're going to look at the bottom of the meniscus to determine what our volume is. And as long as we keep consistent, and we always do that, that will um, work to give our value. In the case of this example right here, we see that this is the bottom of our meniscus right here. And when we're trying to estimate the value, we're going to look at what digits we do know, and then we're going to estimate that last digit. So these graduations right here are 52 and 53 milliliters. From this, we can see that our volume of water is greater than 52 milliliters, but less than 53 milliliters. And what we want to do is just basically take the volume between 52 and 53 and estimate where that last digit is. I'm going to guess that we are at 52.8 milliliters. So these are certain digits, and then this is our uncertain digit. So this is the guessed, the guessed digit, so the one we don't actually know. Another volume that we're going to read in chemistry is that of a burette. And a burette is going to be read the opposite way of a graduated cylinder. 
while we add volume in to a graduated cylinder, we generally remove volume from a burette. So we're going to be starting at a lower volume, lower value volume, and going to a higher value volume as we dispense volume from our burette. So that's the whole idea is you're going to be adding liquid in, and then that liquid is going to come out, and you're going to look at the before and the after. So at the top, you're going to have zero. At the bottom, you're going to usually have 50. So when we're looking at this burette, this is our start point. This is our end point. And again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at the bottom of our meniscus and estimate, but we're going to read down instead. So when we look at this, we see that we're between 9.6 and 9.7. So I'm going to estimate that at 9.61 milliliters. And then for the other one, it's going to be between 24.6 and 24.7. So I'm going to estimate this at 24.66 milliliters. And then the volume that we're actually looking at is how much volume we've delivered. So we would take the final volume, 24.66 milliliters, minus our initial volume, 9.61 milliliters, and that will give us the actual value that we are looking at here, which would be 15.05 milliliters that have been delivered by our burette. Let's look at some example measurements that we might take. So here on the top, we see a ruler, and our units here are centimeters. When we're looking at our box, in this case, we're going to, again, estimate. We see that we are above 1, but less than 2. So I'm just going to make an estimation that this is about 1.8 centimeters. Our left box, right here, we are between 3.4 and 3.5. I would say that we're on the lower end. So I'm going to estimate this at 3.42 centimeters. Again, that last digit is an estimation. You don't have to be perfect with it, just as long as you have the certain digits correct. Now, when we're looking at these, we see that this one has one decimal place. Well, this one has two decimal places. We would say that this device is more precise. And we can see that precision by putting in that uncertain digit. Another note I want to make is that you always want to include your units. All measurements have to have a unit. If I just put 1.8 or 3.42, I could mean centimeters, I could be millimeters, I could be milliliters, it could be any sort of things. Okay, let's try another example. Here we've got a graduated cylinder, and we see our meniscus is right here. We're somewhere between 21 and 22. I'm going to estimate about 21.5 milliliters. Again, have that last estimated digit along with our units. And as long as you do that, you can record good measurements. So now that we know how to take a measurement, we can see how many significant figures we have when we actually do a measurement ourselves. But when we're given a reported measurement, we might have to determine how many significant figures are in there on our own. There are rules for determining that, luckily. So our rules for determining sig figs, significant figures, in reported measurements. When you see a reported measurement, you're going to use these in order to determine which values are considered significant, which ones are considered insignificant. So first of all, Anytime you see a recorded measurement, if you have a non-zero value, they're always going to be significant. So all non-zero digits are significant. 
It's only zeros that you have to look at and determine whether that zero is significant or insignificant. And we have three different types of zeros. Uh, we have leading zeros, trailing zeros, and captive zeros. And those zeros can be either considered placeholder zeros, so just there to tell you what the number is, or they can be there purposely to tell you what the precision of the measurement is. So all placeholder zeros are insignificant. And then we have zeros that are actually placed in order to give us information about that number. So our zero types, we have leading zeros. These are gonna be zeros at the beginning of a number before any non-zero digit. Once you reach a non-zero digit, it is no longer considered a leading zero. And these are just placeholders. So because they are placeholders, they are insignificant. Our next type of zero is a trailing zero. And these are gonna be zeros at the end of a number. Okay, so these can be placeholders. It just depends on not whether or not there is a decimal in the number. So these are placeholders when there is no decimal. And in that case, they're gonna be insignificant. And then they are significant if there is, there is a decimal. Okay. And then we have captive zeros. These are going to be zeros that are between non zero digits. And these are always significant. They are not a placeholder. They are saying this value is zero. It's not one or two or five. It is zero. Let's try an example. So if we have the following number Let's determine how many significant figures we have. And we're going to do that by looking at what the different zeros are. So these zeros right here and these zeros right here are considered captive zeros. They are always significant. These right here are trailing zeros and they are, uh, and they are significant if there is a decimal, which this number has a decimal. So all of these zeros are significant which means that all of these digits are significant, which means this has 14 sig figs. Let's try another example. So again, we're going to have our captive zeros right here, and then we've got our trailing zeros. This number does not have a decimal, so our trailing zeros are going to be insignificant. So this one, we will only count the non-zero digits along with the captive zeros, giving us nine sig figs. And let's try one more. So here we have a trailing zero. We have some captive zeros. And then we also have some leading zeros. 
Remember, our leading zeros are always insignificant. Our captive zeros are always significant. And then this trailing zero is significant because there is a decimal. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight significant figures. Pretty easy. Now, a lot of times we're going to take measured value. Now, a lot of times we're going to take measured values and we're going to do calculations with them. So there are two different types of calculations we're going to look at. Addition, subtraction, and multiplication, division. But let's start with addition, subtraction. So when we do addition, subtraction, we need to determine the number of significant figures the calculated value will have. So when we add and subtract things, we are going to have the same number of decimal places as the least precise number. So if we added 25.0 plus 1.02, we would get 26.02. Our precision here is to the tens place, to the hundreds. So we're going to round at the ten, giving us 26.0. Same thing with subtraction. You're just going to take and round your answer to the same precision that your least precise value is. As a note, if you do not have a decimal place, if you had something like 250 plus 55, we would round to the tens place. So adding these together would give us 305. We would round to this digit, giving us 310 as our value. We can also do multiplication and division of, of measured values. And with our rule here, we're going to have the answer have the name, same number of significant figures as the measured value with the least number of significant figures. So the rule here, the answer will have the same number of significant figures as the measured value with the least number of significant figures. Okay. So for instance, if we take 25.12 times it by 1.1, we would get a value of 27.632. This has four sig figs. This has two sig figs. So our answer is going to have two sig figs. So our rounded answer would be 28. There are going to be times we're going to have to do multiple calculations, so you have to think about your order of operations. So remember to please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, addition, subtraction. So make sure you stay in that order. Anything parentheses first, then your exponents, 
then multiplication or division, and then addition or subtraction. Last thing I'm going to talk about is scientific notation. So we've looked at standard notation so far. Scientific notation is just a shorthand way of looking at numbers, making numbers a little bit smaller, easier to deal with. When we're looking at a value in scientific notation, such as this one right here, this is what we call our coefficient. This is our base. And then this is our exponent. So basically, we're going to move the decimal place 23 times to the right to go into standard notation. And when we do that, like I said, we'll be in standard notation. So just our regular number. Okay. So if we have something like 7,000, if we wanted to put this into scientific notation, there'd be 7 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, like so. And then 6.27 times 10 to the 4. We'd move our decimal back 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, like so. So if we have a positive exponent, that means we have a large number. A negative exponent, like means we're going to move our decimal place to the left to give a smaller number. So we moved it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. OK, and then if we have something like this, to get it into our scientific notation, we need to move it 1, 2, 3 decimal places. So we get 2.45 times 10 to the negative 3. So the negative indicates that you have a number less than 1, positive a number greater than 1. That is everything I have for you guys for significant figures. I will talk to you guys later.